Well, hey guys, uh, I'm just going to ask straight up front. If you forgive me, I've never video chatted or public spoken before. Um, I'm also twitchy and fidgety. So, um, first used a video camera for the first time the other day, just on a computer, which is probably inspiring a fantastic amount of confidence in all of you. Uh, but I just mean this might be a little bit bumpy, but you know, you know, yeah. My name is Bob Papa. You don't know me, but that's okay. I really don't know who any of you are either. So it means we're all off to a good start. This whole idea started out back when I contacted Stan earlier last earlier in the year when I was about a project I'd been working on for quite some time. That project was an online radio station that I'd kind of been building and running as a hobby. I started one just for shits and giggles. When we began speaking, he mentioned he'd been waiting for someone like me to come along to present at the panel, and I'm assuming he meant someone in the radio industry. <laughs> but, you know, he said he'd appreciate it, be interested in presenting a panel at the upcoming summer session. I always love Newgrounds. It's kind of one of the few sites I've visited regularly. I started way back before Pico was a thing. I mean, I've been coming to it forever, and I figured if there was some way I could pay back the entertainment you've all provided me over the years, I should do what I could to help. You know, shortly after agreeing to host something, I had no idea what it was. I kind of wondered what I could talk about on this platform that would be of value to you. You know, my background's in construction, dealing with government, project management, and in corporate business, corporate business operations. I also got mush mouth. Forgot to mention that. I'm modern tech illiterate. I could build your web page in two seconds. I can operate an online radio station, but I really, I just, uh, you know, I can't run social media or shit to save my life. Um, I stopped using computers seriously back in like 2006 when I got my start in construction outside of playing some old video games, fantasy sports, checking the weather, or the Newgrounds portal. If it wasn't work related, I really didn't sit at a computer. Now, being as I first reached out to Stan about the online radio station, though, my initial thought I was kind of focused on that. Never having any proper training, though, I needed to learn some proper lingo and quick. Um, you know, I had already agreed to do this after all, so I bought what were considered some of the top industry books to start learning, you know, some proper terminology and how things were actually supposed to work. You know, um, as I began to read each of the books, it occurred to me that a lot of the pages in the, these books were being spent on how to get the job or what industry people wanted in an employee. Stan made it when we were talking, he made it seem in his own words, of course, and I jumped to a lot of assumptions on it, but he made it sound like there was kind of an old boys club culture when it came to the voiceover industry. And as in, if you don't know somebody in the business or get seriously lucky, you're not really getting in. My brain took me to the thought process. This culture was probably more than likely everywhere in the arts and entertainment business. And as I've stopped my nonstop 80 hour work weeks, I've also grown to realize that it seems a bunch of be a, dis a lot of despair and negativity when people talk about going for a job or after a career they want. It was then I figured I could attempt to give some advice based on my life experiences in the corporate construction world to help you all get ahead, and here we all are. I'm not really claiming to know it all. I've just worn a lot of hats. I've dealt with a lot of people over the years, and I've been in the position of hiring and firing for a long time. I worked from a grunt nobody to upper management, and with the nature of the business I was in, I crossed paths with lots of different people from many different career fields. I've gotten advice from all over the place. And I believe that maybe some of my insights could be useful to you as you go forward in your life and career. I, I honestly don't know where any of you are in your, you know, in your position, in, in your travels or whatever you're doing. Some of the stuff I say, you may have heard said in a different way before. Some may even seem obvious, but, you know, if you pause to think about it for a few minutes, I mean, actually think about it. You know, the stuff I say, you could change your life. You know, the story you tell yourself is correct. If you say it won't work for me, don't be surprised when it doesn't. Just like if you say I can't do something, you got to learn to program your brain in your favor. It's all easier said than done, but through practice, literally anybody can do it. I mean, I'm a stubborn ass and I've done it. It, it just takes time. Understand what I'm going to say is all true, or at least I believe it's true. It's all worked for me and it's worked for other people too. I've got no real reason to lie to you. I don't know who any of you are and I'm not 100% sure what a panelist, so I don't really think I got much to get from this. I just want to do what I can, you know. But whether you like it or not, the world works in a specific way. And if you understand how it works and are willing to put in the work, no one will be able to keep you from getting what you want. If you think you want a Lamborghini but don't want to put in the thankless 80-hour work weeks, don't sit, want to sit there wondering why there's one sitting in your driveway. But at the same time, if you just do something for the prestige, like owning a Lamborghini, 
Don't be surprised when you're sitting behind the wheel of your fancy sports car wondering why you're so fucking miserable. Now, if I lose you shortly after this opening rant, I just want to say, just know that life's too short not to do what you want. You know, you could do anything to make money, but being rich shouldn't be your end goal. Money will happen as you progress, and if you're good at what you do, money will find you. At the end of the day, so long as you can provide for yourself is what you need, you'll be happier than a billionaire of scorched earth by an never heard to get what they thought they wanted. Now, if, if, if you think you need the big paying job or something to be happier, get by in life, you know, open up your town's yellow pages or actually, uh, open up Yelp since y'all probably just said, what the fuck are the yellow pages? Um, you know, I bet you there's a psychic in your area with a storefront office building. And I'm not saying go out and pay for their services. I'm simply saying realize that this gypsy can afford the rent on their office, the expenses for where they live, their vehicle, their food, their cell phone, cost of transportation, and live the life they want, all while being the local area psychic. So why can't you make a living doing what you want? It doesn't mean you won't have to work hard, struggle, do jobs or things you don't want to do in the meantime, but if you really want it, you'll get there. I just hope I can give you some useful pointers to help make sure you get where you want to go, even if you're not quite sure where there is yet. And uh, kind of with that, I'm going to jump into kind of a view from the top. It's, uh, let's say, anyways, if you never had the privilege of being in charge, you know that it comes with its fair share of problems, headaches, and all that. If you haven't, realize being in charge isn't as always glamorous as you imagine. But we're not really here to talk about being in charge. We're kind of more here to take a look at what the people in charge are looking for and how to tilt those odds in your favor, things you can do. All to give you ideas to help utilize to maximize your chances to get yourself the job and on the career path you want to be on. Most of you will more than likely probably never be looking to be in a position where you're actually doing the hiring and firing. You're more than likely to be put on a team or have a team assigned to whatever project it is that you're working on. You know, you'll complain as though you want to be in the position to fire people, but just trust me, it's not as glamorous as a responsibility as you think it is. Uh, for every shithead you get to fire, you got to fire a nice person too. And, you know, it's not for everybody. I, I you know, I think back to something my great grandfather used to say. He used to say, you, you know, you can pick a lot of things in this world, but two things you can almost never choose are your neighbors and your coworkers. So you better try to make the best of it. Now, that doesn't mean people don't deserve to be fired. But realistically, a lot of the times the problem employee in a workplace is due to a lack of coaching or poor management. Um, I made a career out of essentially training people from eating pace to being competent enough to plan out their entire work week before I ever got a chance to sit down with them. I've seen people go from not being able to hammer in a tiny piece of steel in the ground that, you know, that hold up one of those little plastic temporary fences that's lighter than this shit, um, to training staff in a mentor-like role. I've also seen people go from excelling in their field of choice and then through poor coaching and management over time, these same people become shells of their former selves and a detriment to the company and they start to poison the workplace around them. You know, which kind of brings me to my first point if I haven't made one yet. Uh, project managers, program directors, owners, hiring managers, or, you know, we'll just use the word managers from here on out. They're all looking for people they can coach or appear coachable, not necessarily have to change or need to change. Most managers are looking for smart people. And by that, I don't mean spending 10 years in school with a fancy degree and all that, you know. Not that that doesn't help your chances, but being street smart, a problem solver, a quick thinker, sometimes can be a greater asset than book smart. When I was, whenever I was looking to make a hire, I was looking for a type of person. You know, my interviews would lean more towards being a casual conversation than a formal interview. Um, and every once in a while, I touch on their work history, but. I was more interested in seeing how much the person actually thought, you know, how they interacted and would they be a fit for the environment I was going to bring them into. You know, be yourself. For myself, you know, if I, felt, if I found the right person for the job, I'd train them completely from scratch. A lot of the times it's easier to train from scratch than to get someone that's set in their ways. And, you know, that doesn't mean you shouldn't learn, read, or gain experience. To the contrary, you should learn, read, and experience as much as you can. It'll help you in all walks of life, but especially in the entertainment industry. So you having a wider range of general knowledges and experiences will enable you to bring what you know to the table, benefiting both the project's development and increase the end product's enjoyment by the consumer. Just be flexible and willing to learn when entering a new environment. If you truly do have a better way of doing things over time, you can introduce your methods and better the overall situation. It's just nobody likes to know it all right off the bat. People don't listen to them, and you know they usually get combative towards them. 
but spending time learning too, it just helps you grow mentally as a person. With the internet walking around in our pockets, you know, all the time, we learn and retain even less because it's all there. You know, something you should remember is that most houses that are $3 million and above, they, they got a feature in common compared to the ones that are below $3 million, is they all have a library. You know, think about that. You know, people do read and that are successful. That said, you should know the field you're applying to and know what it is you're applying for. Be that talk radio, uh, music, podcasting, voiceover work, or really any field of business in the world, from garbage truck driver to Wall Street investor, learn the industry all you can. If your interview's tomorrow, crash course the, you know, crash course it, especially if you don't know anything. I worked in a field that was highly specialized. I once had a gentleman apply for and get the job after a good interview conversation, and to my surprise, he appeared to know a little bit about the industry. He ended up turning out to become a great asset to the company, and, you know, about a year later, we were hanging around the shop. There was a kid who liked to hang around, he just like garages, you know, oddball. But he was applying to his first career-like job, and he was looking for advice. Um, that's when the guy told him, I didn't know shit about this industry when I applied. He said that the night before his interview, he plugged the company's name into Google, watched all the videos on YouTube he could, read all the articles he could find, and once he got the job, he did everything he could to learn as fast as possible to make himself an asset to the business, and the rest was history. There's a golden rule of this strategy. you got to back your shit up. People who BS and don't back it up usually don't last two weeks, but knowing your field can make you an asset to your respective profession faster. We're going to touch on that in a little bit, but, you know, Learn is kind of what I'm trying to say here. Uh, I don't know if there's any questions, if I should be pausing or if I should just keep rolling or. Okay. Well, let's just say you know what you want to do. You, you learned, you rehearsed, you studied all you can, and you're looking to get a job. Now you're looking to get someone's attention. In the books I read, the, a lot of the things that come up in the radio industry seems you got one energy. Are you able to communicate a message that will grab the listener or viewer's attention? Your ability to communicate. You've got a finite amount of time, no matter the medium, to get your message across. Can you convey whatever that message is in a clear and engaging manner that's both received by the listener and displayed in a manner the company wants it to be? And a sense of humor. Having a natural sense of humor, that's the dog. Having a natural sense of humor can bring levity to any situation, make you memorable, and make you likable. At the end of the day, you can have all the talent in the world, but unless you're Babe Ruth, no one's going to want to put up with a sour attitude, and the second you start to slip, they're going to cut your ass. Just look at Barry Bonds. So, and some of you might have said, who's Barry Bonds? He's essentially the modern-day, you know, Babe Ruth. PDs aside, the real reason he was treated the way he was was the way he handled the media and those around him. People remember how you treat and interact with them, and a sense of humor can help keep that in a positive light. That said, you'd be surprised how much these three categories transition in almost every field of walk of life. People want to be around those with good energy. You do, I do. Having an ability to communicate only helps you in every aspect of life. And a good sense of humor can make you relate to people all the more easier. If you work in the entertainment industry, you know, consider if you're, if you're going for the job, look at the ratings of local networks or in parts of the country where you want to work. Publicly traded companies like video game companies, major animation houses, things like that, they post earning reports and they also post news, you know, as everybody here knows. And if you, if the station's on the decline or if somebody's got a lot of projects going on, they're more than likely looking for applicants or reviewing new job applications to try to turn things around. Once you made these stations, net, you know, once you made this list of station networks and businesses, use the internet to get the contact information for the people you want to get your resumes in the hand of the decision makers. Most managers have their emails posted publicly. You know, if you want doors to open, start looking for ones that might be open a little bit and learn whose name to say when you walk through the door. You know, BS is only gonna get you so far here, you gotta back it up and keep it to work because no one really likes a stalker. Uh, you don't wanna end up on some blacklist by pushing on a side door you found a little too hard. You know, but say you did all your homework, you got everything down perfect and you found where you think you wanna work and apply it. You're waiting to hear back. It's easy to picture a fat cat with their feet up at their cushy jobs where they don't do anything all day long but twiddle their, tongue, twiddle their thumbs. Now, this may be the case sometimes. Uh, it's contrary to how a hiring professional should behave. You know, and if someone like that's going to hire you realistically, you're probably already asking yourself how long you're going to last working at a place like that. 
actual management's job is kind of traditionally putting out fires and dealing with the constantly arising problems of the business, all while managing the frustrations that come with their normal day-to-day -day lives, just like you and me. You know, they're limited with the amount of time and material they can sit down with each day. For instance, I once needed help so bad, I didn't have time to sit down and go through applicants. Anybody who met the bare minimum, I had them come in for an interview, and I had troubles making myself even available for just that. You want the person to bring you in to be in the mood to go over your resume or listen to your demo tapes or whatever it is. You don't want them to feel forced to sit down to get you to stop calling. You know, think about when that friend of yours just, you know, they won't, they, they see something funny and they won't just shut up about it and they, they want you to watch, but you're busy. You don't have the time to give two wet duck farts about what they're trying to show you, but eventually they finally force you to pause and watch. You either stare at that screen blankly and forget everything that just flashed before your eyes, or you don't find it very amusing at all. You know, flash forward two weeks later, you find this hilarious clip on the internet, you show it to your friend, and they respond with, dude, I showed you that like two weeks ago. The point with that, you know, not so great example is you want them in the right frame of mind when they sit down with your stuff. And, you know, that's not to say you might not want to check in every now and then, but when you do, make it a pleasant and good interaction. The squeaky wheel gets the grease, but the wheel that's loud and bothersome gets replaced. You know, you want us to be sure to stay on the right side of annoying. If you, ask that, if you have to ask what the right side of annoying is, you might be skating on the wrong side of it. After an interview, for, for example, it's considered traditional to have three follow-up points of contact. You've got to thank you. Um, you know, your follow-up and then like a two-week follow-up. If you're pushing a little harder than that, you might be pushing a little too hard. And, you know, when it comes to the entertainment business too, everyone's home computer essentially turns into a recording studio. I mean, I'm, I've been figuring it out. But that also means that these managers are bombarded with more applications than the Newgrounds portal is with stick figure animations. Meaning when you check on how your resume is doing, having good interactions with the person making the call can lead you to being more memorable and likable the Mr. Complainy Pants number 75,652. It might annoy or even piss you off like you feel like you're being ignored, but showing how annoyed or aggravated you are will only hurt your chances. If you do call, try to be the person you want to have a relationship with. Take notes as to what the person says, and I mean with a pen and paper. Yeah, after you're done talking to them, people can tell when you're, you know, checking out to write stuff down, but the second you hang up that phone, like, Write down, what you, write down what was said. Write down things that were mentioned. That way you can refer back to your notes the next time you call and you have a follow-up. And when you do follow-up, refer to people by their names. Whether the people realize it or not, the favorite word in any language is your own, you know, your favorite word in any language is your own name. The fact that you remember it will just help you stand out. And any other additional information you can slap, slap in there will just make you more memorable. Just don't make it unnatural and say things for the sake of saying things. It's, that, that'll just come across as weird. Yeah. We have a question from Nine. Oh, uh, yeah. So all right. Nine wants to know, whilst refining reading material, uh, what would you say is best to read between subjects that interest your curiosities for personal growth, or should you be looking more for material related to that industry? I would look, I mean, I would do both. I mean, it really depends on how much time you have to give to reading. Um, I go for personal growth. I'm always reading into weird, random things. Um, I'll go for like, I literally bought an encyclopedia from 1911 just to hear what those people thought. Um, so I'm all over the place, but I, it really depends on where you're at. If you're trying to learn a new part of the business or, you know, something you're trying to get into, I would highly recommend going into that. Um, or, you know, if it's a, uh, you know, at the same time, personal growth, reading, uh, reading conversation books or anything like that matter. Uh, there's a lot of stuff out there on positive psychology, things like that. It's, uh, I mean, I've, the, the self-help industry is pretty much repeating itself every single time, but it's still making a shit ton of money. But I mean, really any subject that interests you, it doesn't hurt. Um, I'll I'd, I pick up literally anything and everything. So I have a book on punctuation that I read. I, read something on uh something on the universe not too long ago i forget exactly what that was but you know i i i just i'd recommend reading anything and everything that interests you you know go go to barnes and noble and walk around for a while and just find a cover that's weird you know but i don't know if that 
hopefully that answered your question, but the, uh, you know, but kind of jumping back on track a little bit, the, um, with that whole writing thing, writing things down thought, um, a guy I once knew, he pulled permits for construction companies and he would keep a Rolodex of cards. You think like flash cards, old school. Um, and for every town hall he needed to check in with, he had a different card. When you meet someone new, he'd make a new card. Uh, he'd know what was mentioned, birthdays, if the people had kids, their likes, their dislikes, frequent vacation times of years, things like that. And he'd be able to go into these town halls and he'd have, you know, personal conversations with these people and he'd develop friendships with them. But more importantly, from a work perspective, having good relationships with these people got them to grease the wheels of progress all that much quicker. He'd get help filling out his paperwork and his permit applications would be slipped to the top of the pile. You know, that being said, you can't just fake interest, you know, to make people think you care. He'd use these notes as reminders until he knew people well enough to discard them. And no matter how good you are at playing a game, you'll eventually get caught. But, you know, be genuine. Most people are just good folks trying to make a living. But um, I see there's something else down there. Yeah, this is a, a question from Belyev's Fox. How should people on the autistic spectrum learn to function within the social environment of corporate business? Ah, oh, I would not give a very, uh, I, I mean, it would depend, I, I guess, I mean, as long as, as long as you're assuming you're functional, realistically, it's just kind of, I, I would uh, study so much as like, I'm going to get into it a little bit later. I've talked about, I've got a thing about talking about conversation, but just learning normal social interactions, how people actually in, interact and, you know, get together with each other. Unfortunately, I'm not that up on, you know, the autistic spectrum, unfortunately, but um, I know, I know some people that have it and, it, it, you know, are there. And I really think it's about kind of learning how, everybody else kind of functions i mean i got a problem where i can't read people worth a shit so um but uh as far as it, it, realistically you know it depending on depending on what's what's going on with you it, it can uh it can really vary um but a lot of your a lot of your strengths can actually play into that like i know quite a few autistic people that are wildly successful in business like one of the main guys at Sikorsky um, Engineering, the helicopter company, they build all the military's helicopters and shit. They, there's an autistic dude down there. He literally is the troubleshooter for most of that stuff. You know, you shouldn't think of it as a as something holding you back. Um, as far as the social environment, I mean, I really always just worked. So I I, I never worried about fitting in too much. I just kind of made sure I was the best at what I did. Um, I wish I could answer your question better than that. Um, but unfortunately, I mean, I, unfortunately, that's what I got. Um, maybe, maybe something I say when I get to the conversation thing that, that could help you out. I mean, um, if you, if you want to message me, I'd be happy to do research into it and get a better answer for you. Um, but, you know, it's kind of learning how to play the game. I think I could help you out and I'd be happy to. But I, I, let me jump back into it. Um, sorry about that. You want to interact with everybody that you meet as you come in there in a kind, personable manner. You know, I kind of say how someone treats the waiter is a good indicator of the type of person you're dealing with. And that's not saying you need to befriend everyone, but treat folks how you want to be treated. Remember that everyone's a person. While it's just a good way to live life, you know, or to play the game it, it, it's important to remember because when you're going for a job you're going to be interacting with lots of different people and that secretary or office manager or even interns are already working with the people you want to work for and sometimes they could have that person's ear and you never know how far a uh, you know a good word from somebody you know a manager trust can go you know and right here i was just you know pretend you did all that you got the job you know thumbs up but say you didn't get the job you know say you did everything you could and you still didn't get the job you know, remember that's okay. Good interactions can lead to future success. Um, perhaps you just weren't a fit for what they had going on. 
but say they have a friend or you know a different part of a project or something you get the referral of the phone call back because they remember who you are and the type of person you are the next thing you know you're getting a phone call for a job you never even applied to it helps to always do good and treat everyone the same you, you never know who's watching or what doors can be open around you i'll say it again everyone's important the secretary, assistant, or intern is not just a person like you, but someone who's already working with the person you're trying to get to hire you. How you treat them and how they feel about you can go quite a long ways. You know, treat everybody as if they matter. You know, you like it when people acknowledge you exist, and this falls under the category of being personal in your conversations. If it's faked, it'll be found out, you know, sooner or later, but it doesn't hurt to not be an ass, at least, you know, in the public setting. And, uh, I was kind of going to pause here. This was between one thought and another. I don't know if there were any other questions or something. Uh, like I said, uh, I definitely talk with you more there. Uh, I Fox, I will murder saying the beginning of your username. Um, okay. Yeah, I'll hang out for a second. Um, as far as dealing with rejection after you apply for a position, I mean, it's really, uh, you know, you got to just, at, at the end of the day, it's, you, you have no reason why they made that decision. You just kind of have to roll it. it. You know, it's, it's, it's a company decision. A lot of the times you can't, you, you just got to try to remove, and it's, it's a hard thing to do, but you got to try to remove your personal self from the situation. Um, it's a, uh, it's, like I say, I've always had things, I've always just allowed things to kind of roll off my back, so I'm, I'm a really bad one to be given advice on that, but that's the best thing I could say is just don't let it get you down. You got to realize that it's not you, you weren't a fit for what they had going on, and you are a fit for something else that's going on out there. You just need to find what that is. You know, it's, it's a, uh, you know that that would be my best advice to you it's just just keep rolling forward Every, everything happens for a reason and you're you dealt with that rejection but it's to get you to where you're supposed to be you just weren't supposed to be there don't spend two seconds on it you know tell yourself you know they weren't good enough for you i always say i wouldn't want to be a place that had me in it in the first place you know but um I'm Chroma key. Uh, what's your personal opinion on the term fake until you make it for me personally? As far as fake until you make it, it's it, it kind of falls to that, you know, you really got to, if you're doing it and you're just completely fake, it is. It's just a show. It's it's dishonest. But it, it, there's as far as talking about confidence or something, that's totally true. Like if you study, I've been I did a little studying on positive psychology as an actual it's an actual science now apparently, and it's it's real stuff. It's actually interesting. Um, I actually I put together uh, like a little chapter of resources that I can email out to anybody or you know however it gets disseminated on here. Uh, I'm pretty sure one of the books that I'm talking about is in there. And uh, it's it's literally about programming your brain. So if you're faking confidence, that's one thing. If you're just being completely false in what you're doing, that's that's something else. You've got to be able to back up what you're saying. You know, but it's uh, faking it till you make it just, it, it really, uh, you know, a lot of it too, not, most of life's just showing up. You'd be surprised how many people are just figuring shit out. Like I, uh, I had a project years ago. I was, I was 22 and I was brought in on a, on a massive construction site, blown out hold. Uh, the entire office was away on vacation and I was the only person that could go down there. And I went down there and they pulled out these blueprints and I had no idea what I was looking at. And I, I was just like, Oh yeah, yeah could help you i knew we could do the job but i knew nothing about it so i just kind of bravado and i went back to the office with the blueprints i asked if i could take them just to make sure i bought all the right materials and i plugged all that shit into google you know if you're gonna fake it you got to be able to back your stuff up kind of like i was saying earlier that guy that um 
interviewed with me, he just, he faked it to an extent. He was still able to handle his shit, though. Um, I hope that kind of answers kind of where I stand on that. Um, but I'll, um, I'll roll into the next part now and uh, keep going. You know, the more you know. It's more than just a catchy PBS one-liner, and that's if they keep saying that these days. I honestly haven't seen PBS in God knows how long. But if you're looking to get in a field of work you've never worked in before, or you hardly worked in before, finding another way to get your foot in the door is a decent strategy. You know, looking for look for a type of job that works directly in the field you're trying to get into. It might not be the sexy choice, and starting in a position you never really planned on doing might not excite you all that much, but it's a good way to get exposure in the industry and learn different aspects of the business. Knowing all the ins and outs of the industry will just make you better at what you do in the end. And in the world of radio, for example, like hosts and program directors have been found in all different types of places. A good manager is going to have their eyes and ears open to what goes on around them. Get your foot in the door and do the best you can at your job, all while you're learning everything else, you, you know, about everyone else's jobs. And always look for ways to move up. Real talent and ability is going to get recognized. Sometimes it just takes time. You know, study your field in depth. As time progresses, while you learn all these things that go into the whole production, and the more you know about what, you, you know, others do in the field, it'll make you more helpful to the overall team. It'll make you better at knowing what each person in the, each position is looking for, and particularly, like, every step I took in my career, I held the job behind it. And I was always able to use my knowledge to help the people below me by better informing the people I was now working with to make them better at their jobs. You know, keep an open mind as you progress. You, you, you never know who your true calling could be somewhere else in the industry in a position you never even considered or knew existed. You know, and you find it by working up through the company in ways and positions you never, you never knew about. Don't be closed off to new experiences or ideas just because it doesn't exactly fit what you think you want or you feel it's beneath you. Not everyone that gets drafted into sports plays the position they dreamed of, but if you work hard, you can earn the position you want. And maybe along the way, you find out you wanted something else all along. You know, I once heard a uh, fresh out of town college, you know, fresh out of college town official, he was, he was being asked by someone who knew him growing up why he chose to go to school for his career. He admitted he never knew about the position until he started working in different fields of his study. You know, he, he didn't even consider what he ended up doing to start, but he kept an open mind with each task he faced and ended up, you know, in a position that suited his skill set that he enjoyed, made him feel fulfilled. And all, all the while, he got into a profession that wasn't very sought after, which means less competition for the position. And if you're good at what you do, you'll make a decent living. You know, if you think that foot in the door method doesn't work, you know, there's a, there was a general manager. I don't know if you know sports. It's the guy that pretty much runs the whole organization. This guy was hired out of the New Orleans Saints. He started out by running mail through the corporate offices of the building. And through hard work and by doing his best, he made, the, he made his way to the position of his dreams. I know another guy, he, uh, <laughs> sorry. He, he always wanted to program video games growing up. The, the dude went to school for it, got out of school, got into a couple of bum companies, but he just kept moving forward. He eventually ended up programming uh, programming casino games out in Vegas, you know, to scam people out of money. And, uh, you know, I think he eventually got in with id, and then he got his dream job. He always wanted to work at Insomniac, and he literally worked on the last Ratchet and Clank game, which is, was like his childhood dream. Like, he always wanted to do that. You know, it's, you know, and everyone will say that's a one in a million, but only one in a million are willing to put in as much work as those guys, you know, as those people have. You know, the people are out there. It's all the years and stuff you don't see these people do that make them different than the average bear. If you're not willing to put in the work that no one sees and you'd rather hang out at the beach, you're doing what you want. Don't sit there and be surprised when you get lapped by someone who doesn't quit. You know, myself, I started out shoveling cement out of swimming pool holes. And by working my ass off, I eventually ended up managing a multi-million dollar corporation down to the investing portfolio. Get your foot in the door. Work ethic cannot be denied. Even if the people you're working directly with don't see it, the people that matter will. And even if no one's watching you work, work like the world is. You know, at the end of the day, you're taking time out of your life to do it, so take some pride in it. And uh, I could pause and wait for the question or comment.
I'll keep plugging away. I'll jump on it once I stop. Yeah. You know, you're getting back into it. Helpful and helpful doesn't sit still and hopeful does. And this kind of works in two ways. You know, if you're good at your job and you have a good work ethic and are helpful, you can't be sitting still to do so. Similarly, at the same time, you won't be sitting still at the same career position for long either. Take time to help others around the office and industry whenever you can. Strive to be the best at what you do, no matter what it is that you do. If you have some free time and some part of the process interests you, ask if you can help out or shadow someone as they work. It's a great way to learn new fields of work, and it's a free way to continue your educational growth, you know, in your chosen field. You might not get paid overtime for sticking around to help out, but it'll pay off in the long run one way or another. The more positively you interact with more people in the industry, the more you'll be thought of, and the more you'll be recommended for more projects and promotions that you never would have heard of or be considered for otherwise. And you might be thinking this is obvious, but to say this is one thing, to follow through on this and bring the best to whatever part of a project or task you're working on, that's another and it's a rare thing to do. People often find things beneath them, even if it's, you know, even if it's their job. Or if it's not on the clock, they don't want to spend their time doing it. You know, well, if you're choosing to do something, you're still doing what you want with your time and it's helping you in the long run. Remember that how you conduct the task at hand, you're saying, this is who I am. And people remember that. Make sure the person you remember it as is a good one. You know, my entire life, I'd regularly, learn, uh, regularly earn new positions or customers one way or another by doing what I felt was the job. Where many others were willing to work away from a project once their technical scope of work was, was complete, my motto was make it easier on the next guy. And I'd try to apply that anywhere I could. Even if no one would know what I'd done other than me, if I was going to take my life, I had time out of my life to do something, make it, I'd make it worth doing. You know, be that shoveling snow or reading a copy or just holding a door for a stranger. Do the best you can and do, do it with a smile and be proud of it. You know, before you think you're too good for some remedial job, remember that a good doorman in New York City makes six figures a year and an excavator operating position in Vegas starting salary there is like 150 to 300K. And I'm not saying run off and be a doorman and a ditch digger, but you never know who's watching and how. But do a good job for yourself, no matter the job, and you do all right. Um, all right, Fox. Um, how do you strive and advance in your field of choice while maintaining your morals and ethics? Um, realistically, that's that's just on you to do you know if the people that you're working with don't value your morals or ethics you gotta you know you you're not you're not really in a very good place um i, I you know as long as it, I, i'm assuming your morals and ethics are okay <laughs> but um you know i would uh you really just got to put your nose to the grindstone and then look for ways to get out of the situation you're in. You know, at the end of the day, you know, people will use the shit out of you if you let them. Um, that's, that's kind of uh, the situation I was in for years, but you really, it's, it's what you bring to the table and the people that you're working with and the people that you interact with will remember that. Like, you know, I could pick up the phone to anybody in the industry I was in and everybody, every single person is going to take my phone call because of the type of person I was, you know, and the people that are still doing it, you know, they have the reputation they have. You just, you have to worry about you. And if you're uncomfortable in the position that you're in, you need to look for someplace other to, you know, to do your job. And obviously, some of these are very, you know, probably tied in communities and things like that. But, um, you know, that's my best advice for you is do the best you can. And, you know, while you're looking elsewhere, but don't let, don't let, you know, if they're going to hold you back just because you got your morals, you know, that's someone out there is going to value that. Um, what's your thoughts on people who push someone to say something that's Sing Piano asks, so what's your thoughts on people who push someone to say something? What's your thoughts on people who push someone to something they don't like? Um, I, I'm not a big fan of it. Like, I think you should, uh, you know, realistically, you should know what you're getting into work-wise. Um, 
So if somebody's asking you to do something that, you know, that you didn't initially sign up for, you know, that's not necessarily right because you're getting into, you're getting into a profession for a reason or something that you want to do. Um, at the same time, sometimes, you know, if it's just something you don't like, cause it's not personally for you, it's kind of more of a business thing. Um, but you know, if it's ethically wrong or just something that you don't personally agree with, that's totally different. Um, but there's a lot of people now that, you know, the people that are still willing to work are getting pushed to do different jobs. I have friends that are constantly getting forced into, you know, different roles or trying to, and they keep standing their ground, but, you know, um, I'm not, I'm not a huge fan of it. I try to put people in a position to succeed over, you know, and that's kind of the environment you should be looking for. It kind of falls under the same thing. Uh, looking for some place that values you for what you can do and what you can bring to the team. And if they're asking you to compromise your values, you gotta, you know, again, kind of ask what you're doing there. Um, over time, I'm not saying jump ship and, you know, hold up both middle fingers and piss on the table out the door, but you know, so. I'll jump back into it. Uh, I got like a little railroad map for me to kind of keep my attention span. But, you know, with any field that you're going into, you want to keep an open ear. Try to listen to everyone and take in what you can. It doesn't mean you need to take their word as gospel, but listen to them. Realistically, even the most clueless person appreciates listen, being listened to, case in point. You know. And who knows, maybe they give you one idea that improves your overall performance, helps you in your career, or gives you some wisdom in your daily life. Doesn't hurt anything to listen. Realistically, the janitor may have more industry knowledge than you think. They have a, they've seen a lot and they've been around quite a bit. You know, I talk to everybody literally from hobos in the park to major international corporate lawyers. You never know where inspiration or help may come from. Useful advice can come from the most unlikeliest places, and that said, some of the most useless info can come from the least obvious places. Just because someone says something doesn't mean you need to implement all of it or any of it for that matter. Not all advice is good advice, and even furthermore, not all good advice is going to work for you. And I just want to pause for a second. I'm not advocating for talking to hobos in the park. I mean, some of them are just, you know, good people that are down on their luck or, you know, had hard times or something, but there are the stabby kind, so... Just be quick on your toes if you're going to pick that practice up. But, you know, no one's perfect. Neither you, the people giving advice, myself included. But everyone likes to feel like they're listened to. Even if it's just drunken gibberish, simply thank the people and move on. Try things out, take what you can use, and toss out the rest. Always be looking for ways to improve yourself in all aspects of life. Following this practice will help with everything and will only make you better in every aspect of life, not just work. Everyone's a work in progress, no matter how infallible they appear. Never stop expanding your horizons. You know, no matter how much you think, you don't know it all. I suggest, I always say, always be learning through reading, watching, experiencing, listening, and talking. The greater your knowledge and life experiences are, the more they'll allow you to bring to the table in your industry of choice, like I mentioned earlier. You know, challenge your ideas. You know, no one person or side of an argument's ever completely correct, and nobody's ever got it down perfect. If everyone around you sounds the same, you should kind of ask yourself what you're doing there. You know, you can't grow in a yes environment. What you or anybody thinks is an opinion, and all opinions should be open to change. And that doesn't mean you should change as quickly as, you know, one of the sports fans that changes every time there's a new champion, but just keep an open mind. Through conversation, everyone can grow as a person. It's when we really stop talking to each other that growth can't happen. A lot of this is already happening today, and that'll take us to the last part of this thing. I don't know if anybody has any questions before I jump into the the last whole bit of this. Um, I don't see nobody typing, so. All right. So a common thread through this entire kind of hoopla that I've been going on is how you deal with others can greatly affect your situation's outcome. It all comes down to communication. And in today's day and age, it's more important than ever to stress the actual importance of learning how to communicate. You know, we're facing kind of a social issue that, you know, I, I'm not very well connected with everybody, but it seems to be widely ignored. And that's the significant ish increase of tech isolation. The art of conversations all have been taken out back behind the tool shed and shot. And common sense has taken a backseat to my mentality. 
This is, and society has slowly drifted deeper and deeper into social bubbles, all made possible by technology. And this isn't going to be an old guy crazy rant about how technology is awful. I'm just hear me out. <clears throat> I'm I'm actually I'm not saying technology is a bad thing. To the contrary, it's a fantastic tool. It's fun as shit. <laughs> I mean, it's got stuff like this and you know everything else that comes along with it, which is kind of a big part of the problem, though. What I'm saying, it's removed the need for what was once considered normal social interaction. And by doing so, has increased the natural conversation gap. And it's a gap that used to be adjusted to naturally when we talk to people from all walks of life regularly in our daily lives. Today, the majority of communication is done via writing words, be that texting or email. Reading gives your brain time to process the information. And the delay in the need for a response allows you the time to come up with a valid response. But you switch that to verbal communication, you've lost that buffer. You now have to hear and understand what's being said to the person in real time. You know, you've lost the time you have to process the information, and you, you, and you got someone's big dumb face staring at you waiting for a response. You know, the fact written word has become the preferred means of communication really hasn't helped, you know, that situation at all. Because when you read something, you know, the only voice you hear is your own internal dialogue which speaks in only a manner in which you understand because it's you. You know, this isolated style of communication has made it so that those even living with each other struggle to communicate with one another. It, this, <clears throat> this makes learning and keeping versed on basic communication styles all that more important. The lack of understanding leads to faster frustration because it feels as though the people that are being spoken to or doing the speaking are not being understood or understanding. You know, with the not... with with the aid of non-stop on-the-go communication, we've begun to grow into kind of a state of permanent high school cliques. You no longer need to adapt to what's in your actual world. You can surround yourself with the people who think, speak, and sound just like you. And you never have to go anywhere without that group because they come along with you. Like on construction sites at lunchtime, you know, it used to be like, it used to be a scene. There'd be music, people would be shooting shit, you'd have you know, fights, card games, what have you, you know, not not everyday fights, but, you know, there, there'd be stuff going on. Now the lunch bell rings and, you know, everybody essentially goes to their own corner, opens up their phone, and it's a silent. It's a ghost town. It's like a library, and it's, it's a little eerie. You know, this added interconnectivity would be good if it was used sparingly. Staying connected isn't a bad thing. Um, it could help everybody grow. But human nature makes us creatures of comfort. We gravitate towards things that are easy and comfortable um but you know being as the majority of societies kind of dove head first into this world of tech isolation people revolve around their lives devices revolve their lives around their devices to damn near addictive levels some people can't walk down the street without rocking t-rex arms you know you got 40 or 50 year old people still living as though they're children not participating in the world around them they instead become ensnared by the digital world at their fingertips that would disappear tomorrow if you shut the fucking internet off, you know? But learning how people communicate can greatly help you convey whatever your message is, be it personal or work, and connect with more people, giving you a significant advantage in life. Years ago, and I mean not so long ago, it was common to congregate in large social gatherings where people would meet up and interact. Communication styles were encountered naturally and slowly adapted to over time. You would, of course, naturally gravitate towards people who spoke in a similar style to you, as, as we still do today. But in social or group settings, where there was a mix of every type of communication style, you'd need to you know, be able to get your message across, no matter who it was you were talking to. This was made easier because the people you're speaking with had also adapted their own natural communication styles. That way, even if you were in two completely different patterns, you can kind of meet in the middle. You know, this exposure to different high school, uh, this exposure to different communication styles would start in your school years, but it would greatly increase as you left school and went off into the world. You know, you'd go off, you'd start a career, travel, college, military, what have you, you know, as people still do today. But sometimes you wouldn't talk to those you considered friends or family for years at a time outside of like maybe a five minute phone call. You'd naturally have to adapt your own communication style to your new environment, your surrounding community, and their respective styles. You know, you do so at least enough to not become a complete social outcast. And, of course, you'd be friendlier with and communicate with those that speak in a similar style to your own natural method. 
And uh, so I keep saying communicate like you. Uh, what do I mean by that? If, if you're unaware, we all have personal st styles of communicating that stem from the way we learn naturally. Um, we all learn using all three, but we have a primary. You got visual, you learn through sight, kinetic, you learn through touch and auditory, you learn through hearing. You know, our base words of communication stem off of how we learn without our knowing. You get, see what I mean, visual. Uh, you feel me, feel kinetic, hear what I'm saying, hear audio. We do all use these phrases, and these are some basic and not so great examples of what I'm kind of speaking of. But you substitute these words in naturally without knowing because your brain automatically picks up on these words. You naturally communicate better with someone of a similar learning style without even realizing it because they speak the same as you. People you become friends with, have lasting relationships with, or just gravitate towards more at parties more than likely have a similar learning style such as yourself. You know, as we enter into this technolo technological age, we must make it a mission to remain educated on these styles of communication as if it was a language in and of itself. If we hope to continue to work together, you know, this important can't be stressed enough if you're looking to go into a career where it's your job to connect and communicate with the masses in the entertainment industry. You can use your understanding of language and conversation and communication to allow you to connect with more people. I'm not going to be pretend to be an expert on the subject of communication. I'm continuing to improve my skills and understanding of communication myself. And I study anytime I have time to give it. You know, I, I recommend to purchase books on the subject. Borrow them from the library if you don't have money. The, the place the hobos go to use the internet. Uh, I'll leave a small list of some good ones. I kind of mentioned that earlier. I've, I've got a resource. I don't know how to give that out. But, you know, I'd recommend taking a non-credited local college course on conversation. They're pretty cheap, and I'll include a link to one of those, too. Um, so long as you show up, it, it's a pretty good introductory class. I took it, and it's, you know, as long as you participate, you're guaranteed to pass. Um, and with internet schooling, it's open up to anybody, even in elementary school. If you could read English, you'd be surprised how well you do just by showing up. And it's kind of fun going off into the world and trying the little exercises they give you. Um, I called it messing with the GP. But, you know, develop and use your, your ability to communicate as a tool. These skills will only help you further excel as you use the tips I mentioned earlier in this presentation and as you move through in your life and career. You know, this skill's importance will help you in life in general. Your ability to communicate will hold, you know, and hold a conversation with more people, keep the world open to you in ways that others will just look at you strangely for. But especially in the business world, though, for, for that world, the ones that with the ability to communicate are going to control the future, you know, fairer or not. Um, I'll, I guess I'll keep rolling. Um, you know, with all that said, I separated this into a separate part because with all that said on the, uh, subject of communication, something I found in my studies and searches that seems to be severely overlooked when you talk about communication is listening. There are literally no introductory style books on listening. It's psychology textbook or nothing. And as you look around at communication or even a few self-help books, you might find a chapter or two dedicated to listening, but rarely much is even said on the subject. Even on YouTube, there's barely anything at all about improving your listening ability. And today, the ability to listen is disappearing faster than the ability to converse. The, the, the death of listening is going to take that with it. Because listening is just as important as talking. Because what are you talking to if you're not listening? You know, and it's all about being forgotten. And if you don't believe me, you can test yourself. You know, next time you're talking with someone, just pause and ask yourself, am I actually listening? And do this internally. It'd be weird if you say it out loud. You know, but it, it's true. As you do this little exercise, you're not going to be... You're not going to be listening. But when you return to what you're saying, you're going to be listening more than ever. You know, before you do this, do you think you're one of the people that are actually listening? Or are you performing what's become habit nowadays, which is wait for the person to get done saying words so you can get in what you already had on your mind when they got two words into what they were saying because well, you already knew what they were saying. That's not listening and actually responding to what someone's saying. That's waiting for them to get done saying words so you can get your two cents in. If you're guilty of this, you know, you've caught yourself, you're definitely not listening. But, you know, if you try this exercise, you can work on your listening skills. You know, I was surprised when I started paying attention to my own bad habits. I, 
I made it a game where, uh, not a game, it was more of an exercise where I couldn't say the first thing that I thought of. I had to say something else. And if it was a good point, I could tie it back in. And that just made me actually listen deeper to what the person said. And I could talk more to the point that they were bringing in. You know, technology itself has also played a role in our ever decreasing ability to listen. Uh, people walk around with earbuds in for the duration of the day. Folks are drowning out what goes on around them naturally. It's extremely convenient to walk around and listen to whatever you want all day. But the advent of wireless earbuds and never ending cell phone coverage means you're shutting out the world around you. Not only are you forgetting how to hear what goes on around you, as you're constantly bombarded with sounds, bombarded with sounds and ideas, you're not really allowed any time alone with your own thoughts and you kind of void yourself any chance to think of something on your own. Um, an exercise I started practicing to kind of combat this, and I, I was doing it before I even thought it could help listening. I, it was just something I tried to use to keep my squirrel brain busy while I was, you know, first attempting to practice meditation. Um, I saw this recommended in a TED Talk on a way to improve listening. It's one of the few YouTube videos on listening. I'll, I'll include a link in that to the resources, but I'm sure you guys could find it. Um, that I made it part of my regular routine. Uh, the exercise is you want to take a little time each day. And it doesn't have to be long to start. Just kind of ditch your tech for a minute. You could be anywhere. And as you disconnect, try to see how many things you can hear. Tune in to different sounds that are around you. Try to see how many different noises you could pick up on. How many birds are in the area. Different sounds of car motors, rustling of leaves, the ice cube machine popping in the freezer, uh, you know, the wall clock humming if they still make those. You know, take a few minutes and... Try to see how many of these things you can actually hear. Try to build up from one minute and actually set yourself like a 60 second timer. That way you're not there all day. You know, try to build up from one minute to five minutes. You know, they say you should have a goal to hit, you know, 15 minutes a day. But, you know, if you can't hit that, don't worry about it. One minute is literally better than nothing. This will help increase your attention span, but it will also help improve your listening abilities. Over time, if you want to add a little creativity to the game, an exercise I started playing was. I label the noises something other than what they are. I live on a major road in, you know, a pretty crappy city, you know, any city in America. And I pretend the constant stream of cars is a bustling seaside and I got beachfront property. You know, motorcycles are speedboats, small engine cars make up the jet ski population. Big trucks or cruise ships going by. All these exercises will help improve your brain's ability to process information. It increases your creativity and the active meditation of the process will not only help you with your focus, but it will actually literally increase the size of the part of your brain that's directly connected to happiness. And that's scientifically proven, not just some stuff I'm saying. Uh, you know, a big problem when trying to improve these skills is that people aren't talking to each other anymore. It makes practice a conversation that much harder to come by. You know, people become so entrenched in their opinions be whatever it is, that it makes it all that much more difficult to engage in civil discussion. Um, today, people that disagree with you are more than likely, they'll either get up in your face or they're more than likely just to politely agree with you to sidestep the conversation altogether rather than actually engaging in a conversation. Yet, you know, having civil discussion with someone you disagree with is a great way to grow your speaking and listening skills. When done so pro properly, both parties gain from the discussion, giving both you a better understanding of what the issue may be, and you know, perhaps by speaking with someone who thinks differently than you, or does things differently than you, it opens your eyes to something you never considered before. You know, just remember what I've said a few times now, not everyone's 100% correct. Don't be so entrenched in your beliefs that you remove yourself from the conversation altogether. True ignorance stems from not asking questions or remaining blind. Just, you know, case in point, remember that the country of Germany thought they were in the right back in the 40s. I got nothing against the Germans, I'm just saying. You know, be open to your discussion, you know, hearing different things. If both parties do so, they stand to gain from good conversation. And it doesn't mean you're going to go around changing people's minds either. It just means exchange ideas, take, don't take it personally, and perhaps both of you gain something to learn about. You know, you shouldn't feel frustrated if someone you talk to doesn't change their mind. Learn to have polite civil discourse and simply be on your way. Um, it's actually a proven fact that when people are proven wrong, 65% of the group that is incorrect will never accept that they were wrong. Even if you do so with hard facts, they will actually attach themselves harder to their conviction that they are right. You can't change that. 
You can only offer some points to hopefully make that person think. You personally should strive to be part of the 35% that's willing to grow. You know, the more you improve your ability to communicate, the better you'll be able to perform in all aspects of life. Collaboration's a big part of the equation and lots of different career paths, and in a big way, it can improve projects. Talking and listening to others will help you be able to improve your own craft far greater than others that sit in their own little bubbles, you know, as well as, you know, improve your own personal self, all while being able to help those around you because you're actually listening to what's going on. You know, if you work hard at what you're trying to do, can communicate with others, actually listen to what's being said and apply the things you learn over time and look for different paths to your end goals, you can do anything and get whatever you want. You, anybody literally can. And it might be cliche, but true work, true hard work pays off in the end. But I'm talking actual hard work and pushing beyond what's expected, you know, while finding different paths to your end goals. The person that keeps running into a brick wall to get through it, to get to the other side, instead of pausing to find a way around that wall, is never getting anywhere. You know, remember that the easiest way to the top isn't always the fastest way, but if you keep moving forward, you'll get there. And so long as you work hard, nothing can stop you. You know, step out of your comfort zone frequently. It's good to be comfortable, you know, you, you, but if you're, if you're always comfortable, then you're not growing. You cannot grow in comfort. You know, it's some, of the, some of the greatest success stories in life come from terrible situations. And again, if everyone around you sounds the same, you should ask yourself what you're doing there. You get somewhere else. It's, you, you can't grow in a yes environment, you know. And uh, something I just want to stress is, you know, I'm getting to the end of your day. As you move up in your career, don't forget people that help you get where you are and don't forget where you were. You were once in their shoes, buy the beer or coffee or whatever it is on occasion. Uh, I knew someone who worked in a pharmacy and they had a Christmas party at a, you know, at a pub. And they, uh, they, they ended up splitting the check 26 different ways. Uh, the pharmacists make six figures a year. Pharmacy techs essentially make McDonald's money and they pay the rights to be licensed to do so. I'm not saying, you know, as you earn more money, you spend more money. So, I, you know, if the pharmacist didn't have it, that's okay. But buying a round doesn't cost that much. You know, a 12-pack of beer or, a round, you know, a box of Joe, it, it doesn't cost that much. And the gesture is a million-dollar investment. And uh, lastly, before I just, you know, completely wrap this up, uh, something I've always lived by, and I, I can't stress it enough, if you don't ask a question, the answer is always no which means if you ask and someone says no, nothing's changed, which means you shouldn't spend time thinking about it. It also means that no matter how crazy the question is and no matter how sure you are that the answer might be no, you might as well ask anyways, because nothing's gonna change. More times than not, you're gonna be surprised by the answer. Um, that's kind of what I had and I mean, I don't know if anybody's got any questions or if they want me to go off on something else, I'd be happy to. Um, that was very informative, man. Yeah, everybody, please feel free to uh, ask stuff in the panel questions channel. Uh, this is the best time to do it. Also, uh, Big Bob Papa, if you've got any insight about your radio station, love to hear more about that, man. Well, uh, yeah, it's a uh, pocket rocket radio. We're just, it's a uh, kind of, it's just something I started doing for, it was just starting out as a hobby. We're kind of doing a uh, kind of a, it's essentially a LARP on a radio station. It's a digital online thing where we've made a fake city, a fake radio station, and we're just going to have fun, you know, and just see what comes of it. Um, there's really not any that plan for it yet, but, you know, we're getting there. Some apps are on the way. We finally got accepted to one of the uh, streaming services, so we're on an app. I think it's uh, like my tuner radio or something like that. It's actually not a bad one. Um, and I made some backdoor app, but, you know, that takes time, but it's it's definitely a work in progress. It's it's a lot of fun though. I mean, I don't know if any if somebody's got a radio internet radio question, if you're looking to do something similar, I'd be happy to answer any question on that too. That's it's not a doesn't have to be specific. All right, we have a question from Deliev's Fox. Uh, have you ever heard about how inefficient and inhumane crunch can be in business environments? Referring to a production crunch. I uh, yeah I. I definitely have. I mean, how I'm sorry, the dog's kind of running around. Um, it's, it's, you know, 
I get companies having project deadlines and all that and things like that and, you know, needing to crunch it from time to time. But I, I also, knowing people that just like talking about the guy that was in the video game industry, like, I know they just take advantage of people like no one else's business too. It's just, it's not a, it's not a great, uh, it's definitely not a good business practice, but unfortunately it's become the way of the day and age. I mean, it's going on everywhere. I mean, you got, yeah, like the, I was, when I was out in California this past winter, I, I was, I was in one of those COVID clinics like eight times because I kept doing shit and, uh, there was a pregnant lady in the house. So I had to keep going to get tested. And, uh, they're making 250 bucks a pop on a test. So they had like a carousel line around the building and they, all the nurses were essentially just getting paid over minimum wage. I did out the math. I think they were making like, I think it was like eight grand, eight grand an hour. And the test, the test turns out only costs like, I think it was 300 bucks for 40 tests or something like that. It was like, I wanted to start my own. I want to start like a COVID truck, ice cream truck business, but that's getting way off subject. Um, but yeah, no, it's it's unfortunately a bad practice. But um, I mean, uh, and you definitely once you start riding people too much, you're not getting the same work production out of them. Um, it's yeah, that's that's kind of why. Like I said, I I, I can just ramble forever, so I don't want to do that to you guys, but. Um, I don't know if anybody's got else got any questions. If that answered your question, I don't like. If you would like me to elaborate on something, I'd be happy to happy to talk with you. I've actually, I'm. Yeah. Sure. I've got another question for you. Oh, this one's for me. Yeah. For, you know, you mentioned earlier when you're knocking on doors and things. You know, one thing to avoid is knocking too much or too hard. Um, but what are some other things you'd suggest people avoid as they're trying to make their way into their dream career or getting started for their first, you know, major step in a new industry? What should they avoid doing? Uh, I, I, I really didn't like when people are just yes people. I really like when you come in and you be yourself. And I mean, it's, it's really, if you work for the position, you work for the position. Um, like the guy was saying earlier with the, uh, the chroma key with the fake until you make it like, you know, you can't stand people that are like that. And I get a lot of that goes on in industry and, uh, it's unfortunate. Um, but yeah, I would say, uh, man, I should have written down. Cause that's one of the things my brain ain't, uh, ain't as good as it used to be. Um, but. I would say as, as you're going in and you're applying to different things, like, like I was kind of saying earlier too, about keeping an open mind too, like just, just look for different avenues and things like that, you know, be open if they offer you something and you take that and, you know, say that other person gets hired and they get fired and there's another position opening. My, my friend that works for a hospital, she's just started out as clerical and they're already trying to move her up to management because management quit and she's good at her job. You know, it's, she doesn't want it. She's just doing it for side money, but it's, you know, that's the world that's out there. Um, Oh, all right. Oh, Fox is sending something else in. I I would try the first word, but I'm I know I'm an American. As far as telecommuting, uh, Blylev, or I don't know if that's how you say it, but Fox asks, he says, what are your thoughts on telecommuting and how its effects on social relations in the business environment? Um, realistically, I, 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 I'm a cold, calculated capitalist. I just want people to be good at their jobs. Like, I'd rather be surrounded with people that are best at what they do. Um, you know, obviously, you want to work with good people that are good people, but... Um, you know, I said when COVID first started, I was like, dude, this could jump the world forward so much farther, you know, if we just let it with technology and things like that. And a lot of stuff has happened. Um, 
but you know when you the fact that corporations aren't jumping at it i think is just because you know they have all these leases on these buildings you know they've already paid to build the buildings they got to have an excuse to have them it's a tax write off you know heaven forbid they give that money to the employees but i mean i think telecommuting and you know distance working that's one of the great things about you know how i said technology technology is a fantastic tool like it really can make the world so small you know um I I personally think it's a great thing. Uh, that you think people would want people working on the internet because you know everybody who's doing everything. Um, not a bitch says, how would you know how much you're worth? That's a loaded question because I've never been able to value myself. I find it sometimes easier to work for free than it is to put a number on myself. Um, I've had I've been told you know you, you kind of it kind of consult the industry industry averages and things like that a lot of a lot of average salaries are posted online and I would say go from there you know value value yourself as how good you are um, but if you overvalue yourself too you might not get work if you get work and then you can raise your prices from there but um, yeah, I would I would definitely say with with the amount of resources on the internet there you can definitely find out what you should be making and what part of the country you are and things like that, but if you're able to work on the internet that doesn't even matter. You know. Um but I've been, I've always been able to value other people's works and it's kind of weird that I've never been able to put a number on my own. So I I honestly I don't I couldn't tell you exactly how to do it, but that's what I that would be my recommendation to you. All right. Praise Bob. There you go. Um, if you don't know what to do for a go on. Go. Praise Bob asks, uh, if you don't know what to do, what what to do for a niche, like it all, how do you go about trying to pursue things? And then he goes on to say he hopes it's not a dumb question and i will continue to say there's no such thing as a dumb question just you know the, the people that don't ask questions are the ones that remain dumb um as far as um what to do for a niche i mean realistically if you're not sure what to go after i would just go after anything that interests you like i like i said earlier the the guy uh, the town official he ended up in some weird waste sewage management project and um he uh you know he never would have found that if he didn't just try so many random different things um i would say just try to get yourself out there and do what you want you know try different things you you never know what you know some you might be into something you don't even know exists yet or you know some part of the process um that would kind of be my best advice to you is just kind of get yourself out there. Everybody kind of sits still spinning their wheels, thinking about it so much, but just go out there and do it. I mean, I was, uh, there's a, uh, 
like that. I, I and I don't know if any of these web pages are scams or not. I haven't spent any time on them, but you know, you got like the Upworks and the Fivers of the world and things like that. You could just jump in on oddball projects here and there and see if something interests you. You know, you got to be able to back it up with you sign a contract to do something. But thankfully, YouTube and all that stuff's out there, and most things are pretty easy to figure out. Um, but I'm sure you have an idea what you're good at, and I would just try everything, you know, or, you know, get yourself out there a little bit and experience stuff, you know, even if you could just try to do it for free, you know, like see if there's a, a community in your area that you can go do something, you know, uh, local radio stations usually got openings. They work on mostly volunteer work and things like that. So, yeah, public access stuff. It's not, it's not sexy stuff, but it shows you the industry. Um, it's not a bad avenue to start at, you know. So, not a bitch says with the rise of AI art, will the furry commission stop rolling in? I highly doubt that one. I I would say you're, you, um, you know, people are into what they're into. Uh, you know, maybe 20 years down the road, people aren't into that anymore, but there's there's still some weird shit people are into. Uh, sorry, I've literally, I'll literally answer pretty much anything. But, you know. Uh, Fox asks, would you consider social media to being successful in the corporate business environment? Um, I wouldn't. I... I I made it to where I was and I never used social media, but it's also, it's probably very industry specific. Um, I'm sure you need a presence somewhat in certain environments and things like that. Um, you know, there's a, I forget, there's, there's a business social media that a lot of people are on that I can't think of the name of it right now. And something like that would probably be more important than say, you know, a Facebook or something like that. But um, as far as the corporate business world, uh, it's really on the connections you make. I would, I would simply try to get your foot in the door somewhere and, uh, you know, have at it that way. Um, like I said, that, that, that GM from the New Orleans Saints, the dude literally started out running a mail. He was just, he was just a gopher and he, He's managing a team in the NFL right now, which is insane to think. Uh, But not a bitch asks, how much will the animation industry be affected by the massive amount of cartoon shows being pulled from HBO Max Discovery Plus merger? <clears throat> um, I'm going to be straight up. I don't watch TV. Um, so I don't, I don't exactly know this exact news story that's going on. Um, but realistically, that's a big part of the problem is right now is the amount of content that's being just they're they're letting it become monopolized to the point where there's selective stuff and there's only so much things that are out there. I I really think there's kind of, you know, maybe like you've got a new grounds, but a proper place where you can get animation shows and things like that would um you know, really be, you know, like the Fox and the, the Fox News Network. Nobody remembers it, but back in the 90s, it was a joke that you couldn't get it on TV. And they were kind of the outside network. They were doing all the raunchy stuff, the Married with Children, which is team by today's standards and the Simpsons and things like that. It was getting everybody up in a rile. And, you know, with the advent of the Internet, I think the Internet's really going to have to, you know, come up with something to kind of save a lot of this stuff because, and that and the amount of creativity that's being lost, it's the same people that are getting the TV shows. And I mean, a lot of the writing out there just sucks. Like I haven't gone to the movies in a while. That's why I canceled TV. Most of it sucks. What I watch is on Pluto and you know, I'll watch Iron Chef till the cows come home. But, uh, you know, most most of the stuff's just drab. You know, it would be nice if there was some place to get stuff.
Oh, you could, you could definitely make that. That's uh, not a bitch ass. How how much of a chance is there for a new program like Cartoon Network, Nick Disney being able to be made nowadays? And you could definitely make it. You just need the people to get together to make it. Um, Cartoon Network was just a bunch of, you know, animation houses that threw something together. Um, Nick and Disney, I mean, and especially today, because more and more people are canceling cable. Like the only reason cable companies are still in business because of the internet. Um, so really it's building yourself the platform that would interest people. And you need to, you need to bring the programming that people actually want to watch, you know, having the creativity and things like that. You need the branding, but, um, you get the ideas behind it. I mean, it's really wouldn't be that out there to do. I mean, it's, it, it's borderline why I started this radio station thing. I got sick and tired of hearing about COVID on the radio. Like that's just, <laughs> You know, make your own market. Um, but, you know, with the infrastructure out there, it's not, it wouldn't be that hard. Um, it'd be getting the word out there, um, you know, the operational setup. You got my brain working on it now, shit. That's I'll have it invented by tomorrow morning. Uh, is it getting too oversaturated? I mean, I think the way people, in a way, yes and no. I mean, unfortunately, I really don't know where that many people get their art stuff from. Like, I, I, I'm really not kidding when I say I pretty much use Newgrounds. And outside of that, I'm building web pages or doing things, you know, I'm usually working all day long. I'm a, I'm a, I'm a registered workaholic. Um, I actually fell out a lot of the animated stuff because I just didn't, didn't care for it. Um, but there's a lot of, uh, you know, I think if you've got a quality product, you do all right. You know, you got to have the right writers. You got to, you know, you got to have the right, writers conduct and things like that sorry i'm letting the dog out um yeah i don't know if that answers your question or not i i really think there is a place for that because i like i was saying with the car you know making your own network and things like that in the digital sphere just because there it's people are getting sick of the stuff that they're shoving down your throats and calling good you know you'd have to you got to get the right brand and you know, you got to get some quality material and have a set format. But, you know, getting on an Amazon Fire Stick isn't that hard. Um, and and going from there, um, I actually don't think that's a terrible idea. <laughs> you know, it's... So, I don't know if anybody's... Kind of looks like people have stopped typing, so. Um, yeah. Yeah, I guess I'd, I'd thank you guys for listening to me, uh, you know, my shtick and all that. Uh, I appreciate it. If you, I don't know how to get the uh, resources to anybody, but if you want to message me either on here or, uh, you know, uh, I don't know if I should have you email the radio station or not, but. Uh, yeah, Newgrounds is a streaming service would kind of be a home run, but at the same time, it's, uh, I'm sorry, I got off track, track there, but Fox asks, do you think Newgrounds streaming service would be a good idea? I, I think it'd be a decent idea. You gotta, you'd have to, uh, kind of organize it a little better, you know, more front page stuff. Uh, you know, you'd have to make proper episodes though. I mean, people really are getting goldfish attention spans. So five minute animations are probably the way to go. Um, it's, it's, it, the physical media a lot of people are getting away from I mean I th these boxes behind me are literally filled with racks of CDs but I'm a, I'm I'm insane so uh, that's that's uh, you know I, I, I'm the exception of the rule I really think the digital playground is a place to play um 
I would not know what the Pixar art says. I'm sorry. I'm just talking to questions without reading them. Um, not a bitch ass if new rounds, physical media is possibly fortuitous. And they said like a CD or art book or sorts. Um, I mean, you could do a collector series. I mean, people buy stuff like that. People like getting stuff like that all the time, but it's, you know, it, it, there's a lot of overhead in that. I think you'd build towards something like that. I wouldn't, you know, outside of a limited run, I don't know how long you would do that and how much you do that for. Um, yeah, you know, something like that. It could be like a yearbook for the community. I mean, people might actually get a kick out of that. But I, again, I, I'm weird. I still like physical media, so it's... <laughs> that's that's one guy talking in a sea of people that are in the digital realm. Okay, I thought I saw someone else type. But, um, so yeah, no, I just want to thank everybody for hearing me out and things like that. And if you know, if you want to get in touch or something, it, it feel free. I'm happy to help anyone out. Um, you know, I'm actively currently down. I got physically injured earlier this year, so I got time to help people out. Um, and yeah, so I just say good evening and thanks for coming by. Yeah.